I want to thank the uh, organizers for inviting me. <laughs> I was worried for a while that I would be out of place because a, a lot of the uh, sensory uh, uh, phenomena and so forth were rather different to what I study, but uh, we've gotten into questions about evolution. And evolution is uh, changing pretty rapidly. And what I want to talk about is how biology, as biological action, brings cognition into evolution. And by cognition, I mean action based on knowledge. And uh, I hope that will become clear uh, in, in the talk. Now, how does cellular and genome modification occur in evolution, which is my specialty? And the fact is it occurs organically, biologically. It doesn't occur randomly. It's not accidents. Uh, it's not physics. It's biology. And we'll see that uh, as, as we go on. Uh, random mutation cannot explain evolutionary variation. Uh, if we uh, assumed a, 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 an impossibly high mutation rate to positive uh, variation of 1%, which is orders of magnitude too high, uh, and we were looking at just random mutations in the genome, in the DNA, uh, to make a sequence of 10 base pairs, we have a probability of 1 in 10 to the 20. It would take 10 to the 20 generations to make a sequence of 10 base pairs. And one can't build a genome on, on, that, uh, uh, on that basis. Uh, we know that in um, uh, organismal reproduction, 99.9% .9 of all incorporation errors into the DNA are removed by replication proofreading systems, which are biological systems. They scan the DNA, they detect changes in, in the uh, structure of the double helix and uh, detect mispairing, mis and they remove the newly incorporated incorrect nucleotide. So that's cognition and action uh, in reproduction. And also, uh, um, more than 99% uh, of the spontaneous mutations that occur, uh, the so-called spontaneous mutations, turns out are enzymatically induced by various kinds of mutator polymerases or uh, uh, enzymes which modify uh, the bases in the DNA. And um, uh, when those functions are removed, we see a, a big drop in the so-called spontaneous mutation rate. So biology is, is, is central to uh, genome change. And uh, there are two kinds of change that are biologically mediated. Uh, one is, uh, I'm having trouble seeing my slide here. Let me see if I can uh, uh, view it differently. Um, the, the coordinated cellular activities are required for, for uh, uh, certain events to occur. And that's in cell mergers and symbiogenesis, which is achieved by cellular engulfment and um, uh, that's the, the origin, for example, of eukaryotic cells two billion years ago, and the or origin of all photosynthetic eukaryotes uh, by uh, integrating uh, cyanobacteria as uh, plastids or chloroplasts uh, in, in, into, into the cells. And the other process that is involved in uh, cytomechanics and the physical manipulation of the genome are whole genome duplications, which are very widespread in evolution because uh, that's how we've acquired so many different functions uh, and different kinds of proteins. The genome is duplicated and made it possible for functions to be preserved and other functions to arise and uh, their uh, whole genome duplications are, are, are uh, almost universal in, in, in uh, 
eukaryotic lineages. Now, there are a series of events which have been documented to occur in uh, evolution uh, derived where they've been DNA genome sequences that told us about events. And uh, there are events that require the uh, cleavage and ligation of uh, several DNA segments. And that's why I call it natural genetic engineering because cells are able to restructure their DNA. For example, there are horizontal DNA transfers. So in a single step, an organism can acquire a trait from another unrelated organism. And it, the, the trait, let's say, uh, uh, the ability to digest plant material uh, passes from the, the source organism, a bacterium or a fungus, for example, to a uh, herbivorous uh, nematode or a, a herbivorous beetle. And in addition to the DNA uh, manipulations which have to occur, there's a process of transfer and acquisition of the DNA and, and its integration, which is the uh, ligation of, of the uh, segment of DNA that's acquired. Uh, there, uh, we've also discovered that proteins don't change one amino acid at a time. They change by rearrangement of domains, uh, and domains are, are substructures of, of the proteins which have functionalities. And these functionalities can be re rearranged in different ways. But um, for that to happen, again, we have to, uh, the evolving organisms have to cut and splice their DNA and put the uh, domain encoding regions into uh, new, new configurations. Uh, viral integration, uh, as uh, was said yesterday, is very important in, in evolutionary change. Uh, sometimes virus integration into the genome is called endogenization. And viruses provide new functions. They provide transcription and other expression signals. Um, uh, viviparous reproduction of mammals, for example, would be impossible without integrated retroviruses uh, in the mammalian genome. So um, uh, virus integration is important. Um, transcriptional networks can be rewired and reformed by transposable elements. These are pieces of DNA which can move from one place uh, to another. Um, this is what Barbara McClintock discovered uh, in the 1940s. That, uh, parts of the genome can move from one place to another. And in fact, in the genomes of complex organisms, those which have the most uh, uh, neural activity uh, that many of you are interested in, uh, the transposable elements are a larger, much larger fraction of the genome than the protein coding DNA. And we've learned that they encode functional non-coding RNAs. And uh, those RNAs are extremely important in, uh, in, in evolutionary development and change. And finally, the chromosome rearrangements where the DNA has to undergo DNA double strand breaks and they have to be repaired. And uh, the uh, fragments can be recombined in uh, uh, a different uh, organization. Sometimes there can be homologous recombination between repeats which have the same sequence but are dispersed at different locations in the genome. And the transposable elements themselves, uh, in addition to their ability to move to new locations in the genome, can rearrange uh, existing chromosomes and play a part in that process. I don't want to go into the details of how all these things happen, but I'll just give you a couple slides to uh, kind of give you a picture of this. So this is a slide from a paper by uh, 
uh, Nakashima, Nishihara, excuse me, um, about uh, the ability of, of uh, mobile elements, sign elements or retrotransposons uh, to move uh, various kinds of, of uh, signals into the DNA to new location. Here he's got uh, CTCF binding sites uh, on these elements. Uh, more commonly, one finds enhancer elements on these elements. And when they insert it at a new location, they put the nearby genetic locus under a distinct form of control. So that's a, a, a very important modification because uh, these elements can go to multiple locations and can build up networks of functions which respond to the same uh, uh, transcription factors that we heard about earlier. And uh, we know that the network uh, uh, um, elaboration is an important part of, of uh, uh, evolutionary change in the genomes of very complex organisms. So, um, uh, the transposable elements uh, are, are, are very important in, in uh, changing the uh, genomes and evolution. Now, biocognition plays a, an important role in the initiation of evolutionary genome change. Forum sensing pheromones, these are uh, signal molecules which uh, microorganisms make, both prokaryotic and eukaryotic. And they trigger to get DNA uptake in direct cell to cell contact in bacteria, and it's enhanced in biofilms, and prokaryotic evolution occurs by cell to cell DNA transfer, horizontal DNA transfer. Uh, Mating pheromones trigger oriented cell growth and cell fusions in yeast. Abiotic stresses activate transposable elements in all types of cells. So physical damage, heat, radiation, uh, oxidation conditions, toxic metals, insecticides, synthetic organics, they all activate the movement of these uh, elements and changes in genome structure. Uh, Biotic stresses also activate uh, uh, genome change through the activation of recombinases. Those are proteins which can rearrange uh, uh, DNA segments. Uh, targeted DNA cleavages can occur. Uh, transposable elements can be activated and uh, they uh, in, in, involve in changes in ploidy in all types of cells. So these include virus infections, toxins, predators, telomere erosion, inflammation, tissue culture. All of these stresses on organisms activate genome change. And we'll see an example, example of that shortly. Starvation in particular activates transposons and retrotransposons in bacteria. And in uh, Originally, it was found in cancer cells, but then it's been seen to occur in the germlines of other eukaryotes. Uh, chromosome breakage and the formation of DNA encased in a micronucleus in the cell for formation is a trigger for a process called chromothripsis, which means literally chromosome shattering. And uh, I'll show you a picture of that in just a second. And finally, interspecific hybridization is a process which is seen more and more to underlie speciation. It disrupts epigenetic regulation of the genome, in particular of transposable elements. It activates transposable elements in chromosome rearrangement and uh, initiates whole genome duplications and rapid speciation in eukaryotes ranging from yeast to flowering plants and vertebrates. And rapid speciation means speciation in three or four generations. 
the, it does not take long periods of time for new species to, to evolve following uh, interspecific hybridization. Now, this is an illustration from the first paper where this process of chromothripsis was described in cancer cells. And these blue lines indicate where in the chromosomes of the human genome there are breakpoints that are joined together. And so this uh, cancer, this particular colorectal cancer, has 239 rearrangements limited to chromosome 15. Here's a thyroid cancer which has 77 rearrangements on the short arm of chromosome 9. Here are 55 rearrangements on chromosome 5. And here are 85 copy number variations on chromosome 8 in a lung cancer cell line. So these kinds of uh, changes are limited they're non-random because they're restricted to individual chromosomes, uh, but they, they're, they're very complex and they lead to very complex restructurings of, of, the, of, of the chromosome. And here you can see this happening in real time in a paper by Umbright et al. in 2020, where they uh, followed uh, the processes, processes of uh, generating uh, genome complexity from a single cell division error. Here is, some, here is a micronucleus, this round structure here. Here is the, um, the, the, the rest of the uh, nucleus with the, the, the chromosomes. And um, as, they, as they go in, uh, DNA replication is in green and chromosome uh, 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 replication uh, shattering is, is, is in red. So let's look at that just a little bit more again. At this point, the nucleus, the nuclear chromosomes are replicating um, the uh, micronuclear uh, DNA is not replicating. Still replicating. Now the chromosomes are condensing and getting ready for uh, mitotic segregation. And here these uh, nuclei uh, are fragmenting and undergoing uh, active DNA replication. Now, uh, in addition to playing a role in initiating genome change, biocognition is also important in executing genome change. And this was stated very clearly by Barbara McClintock 40 years ago in her Nobel Prize address. The conclusion seems inescapable that cells are able to sense the presence in their nuclei of ruptured ends of chromosomes, and then to activate a mechanism that will bring together and then unite these ends one with another. And this will occur regardless of the initial distance in a telophase nucleus that separated the ruptured ends. The ability of the cell to sense these broken ends, to direct them toward each other, and then to unite them so that the union of the two DNA strands is correctly oriented, is a particularly revealing example of the sensitivity of cells to all that is going on within them. They make wise decisions and act upon them. And I think it's hard to say that these are not cognitive actions by by the cells. And um, other uh, roles for biocognition in executing evolutionary events are coordinating cell engulfment during symbiogenetic cell fusions, fertilizations and pathogenesis. And these all these uh, uh, processes uh, form 
uh, new uh, uh, or organisms or stimulate uh, uh, organisms to evolve. Pathogenesis, for example, infection is a, is a, is a great source of, of genome instability. Uh, establishing mating pairs during horizontal transfer in prokaryotes and sexual reproduction in eukaryotes is essential. Forming multi-molecular new nucleoprotein complexes needed for genome restructuring. Uh, I put down here retrovirus retrotransposition and chromatopsis. These complex events where an RNA molecule is copied into DNA and then inserted into the genome is a very complex affair with a, requiring a very high degree of, uh, uh, of cognitive action. Uh, and as you saw, chromotrypsis is a complex process, but a highly organized process as well. Uh, the formation of intranuclear repair centers and recruitment of damaged chromosomes to generate rearrangements. Uh, uh, when DNA is damaged, it can, goes to a special locus in the, uh, uh, in the nucleus called a repair center, and multiple chromosomes can be in that repair center, damaged chromosomes, and joining them together will create rearrangements. Uh, there are uh, complexes in DNA damage repair which are sp specifically known for recognizing different kinds of lesions in the DNA. And uh, I think that's called recognition, which I think makes it cognitive. And uh, the response to altered epigenetic status in interspecific hybrids, which leads to rapid speciation, is also, I, I would argue, a cognitive process. And so I, I just want to finish by asking a question which has been taboo uh, in conventional evolutionary circles. Uh, but I think we can begin to ask now, could cells have tools to guide evolutionary uh, change adaptively in response to cognitive inputs? And uh, there's one answer that's rather trivial, but it, it, it is important that we can say yes, that the stress activation of uh, uh, genome change, uh, movement of tra transposable elements and other mobile DNAs, leads to uh, loci uh, which share the uh, same stress sensitivity of the transposable element. There's a, a, a nice paper about this in, in, in maize. And the micronucleus trigger for chromothripsis is a source of complex gen genomic novelty in a restricted region of the genome. And again, it, it, it's, uh, 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 it's a sensory process because if there's no micronucleus, uh, chromothripsis does not occur. Uh, secondly, we know that organisms can target the uh, insertion of mobile genetic elements, mobile DNA, uh, within the genome. Proteins can direct insertions to specific sites or to DNA in a particular functional state. There are insertion preferences for particular transcriptional and epigenetic states across the genome. Some elements like to go into silent regions, some go into actively transcribed regions, and transcription factors guide transposable element integration. So for example, in yeast and uh, also in um, other uh, single-celled eukaryotes, uh, transposable elements are, are guided to insert near tRNA loci, where they won't cause uh, damage to those highly compact genomes. And finally, I just put in here that complex phenotypic novelties frequently result from the formation of genomic islands. This is both in uh, bacteria and pro prokaryotes and eukaryotes that have 
home, our home to genetic clusters that have been associated with speciation events in eukaryotes and uh, mobile adaptivity determinants in prokaryotes. Um, so the, the idea is, is there any targeting that's possible which uh, biases which kinds of sequences can be integrated into these genomic islands uh, at times of, of uh, uh, taxonomic change. So uh, I hope uh, that I've convinced you that, that there is biology going on in evolutionary change. It's not a matter of statistics or accidents. And the, the, this biology presents a, 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 a huge uh, opportunity to think about cognitive processes and biologically guided processes in evolution. In evolution. So I think uh, with that, I'll, I'll stop. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have time for a two to three questions. So. Okay. Okay. That that was really quite fascinating, and it raises the to me it raises a really interesting question about how, for example, the insertion of transposable elements. How might that be guided by um, the environment? Uh, you know, is there, what's the intelligence behind that? And I, I want to uh, relate this to a phenomenon that happens, uh, that's known to happen in neuroscience, which is not evolution, but um, it's the change in the genome of neurons in the brain due to experience. So uh, it's now known, you know, the phenomenon of somatic mosaicism is emerging as a really interesting topic in neuroscience, and it's been shown by Fred Gage that um, maternal deprivation will induce retrotransposition in, for example, hippocampal neurons. So this is a way in which experience will change the genome of neurons. And Li Wei Zai has, has shown that uh, fear conditioning produces double-stranded breaks in um, in uh, the chromosomes of neurons in the hippocampus. And what's really interesting is where those breaks occur in many cases, uh, and the breaks might be reflective of retrotransposition insertion, but she didn't show that, but where these breaks occur are in genes that are associated with synaptic plasticity and neuronal excitability. And so how does, how, does, how do the neurons know where to put those breaks? You know, how do they, if, if it's reflective of a retro uh, transposition, how, does, how, does, how do the neurons know, uh, you know, where to, how, how, where to put the retro transposons? I mean, do you have any insight into that? Well, in, in the cases we understand, it's generally that the, the integration proteins the integrases of these elements bind to transcription factors and they go where the transcription factors are located. So in, in yeast, for example, uh, the localization of the insertions near tRNAs is by an interaction between uh, one of the tra RNA polymerase three transcription factors and the integrase of, of the, uh, uh, the retrovirus-like uh, retrotransposome. Um, you, you're describing a situation where experience is going to activate the uh, changes in the regulatory uh, configuration of, of the cells. And uh, that can have um, uh, deep effects on, on the way uh, DNA change takes place. And I, I think that's uh, uh, mechanistically that, that's certainly plausible. 
And I think that, uh, one should try and see if there's any way to establish uh, the correlations. And does that answer the question? Yeah. Thank you so much, Jim. That was fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. Um, to what, it, what do we know about how, how function is maintained after these dramatic events like chromothripsis and, and anything that disrupts a transcriptional uh, network? Um, do, what do we know about what percentage of cases um, you know, continue to function or function in a new way? Um, it's, in, in some respects, it's not surprising that two to three percent of cancer cells show evidence of chromothripsis, but what about healthy cells? Well, uh, all these re complex rearrangements, and I've only picked out one chromothripsis, are, show, are found in, in germlines, in the human germline and in plants and animals. Um, First of all, in eukaryotes, they occur in diploid cells. So um, there is another copy, plus which uh, processes like the hybrid speciation lead frequently to whole genome duplication, which it has the effect that you have the pre existing repertoire of functions, plus you have a whole set of, a whole other set of coding regions, which can be played around with, can be experimented with. And I think that's how the uh, 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 function is maintained and new functions uh, are, are generated. Yeah, so before we end, um, I get to ask a question. <laughs> so, <clears throat> um, you know, chat GPT, right? So I always start, uh, I always inquire now, I put in the question, what is so-and-so famous for? And it makes things up most of the time. But uh, one thing I asked is, what is Dr. James Shapiro's uh, primary work? And it gave me a description of your natural genetic engineering and the part that attracted my attention was that gene mutations or changes in the genes are not random. Would you like to elaborate on that? Or is ChatGPT making things up? No, I think that's a, an accurate description. Because, if, first of all, if, the, if the, the, the genetic changes include a defined piece of DNA, a defined retrovirus or other transposable element, a DNA transposon, moving into different places in the genome, that's not random change. It's the same piece of DNA. And it, it will have certain kinds of effects, such as carrying transcription factor binding sites to these new locations. Uh, the, the second thing is that if uh, uh, gene, DNA breakage and rejoining occurs uh, in response to stimuli, that means that gen genome change is not random because it's happening in response to conditions. And uh, I think we'll find that many major evolutionary transitions occur at times of, of, of major stress on the organism. Uh, so, I, and I, when you're uh, recombining <coughs> different regions of DNA and putting them together, I don't know what you could call it except for natural genetic engineering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, let's give a round of thanks to all our speakers for this. <laughs>